Well, yeah. Let's just wait for everyone to get. <clears throat> let's wait for everyone to get back. Yeah. I think most of us are back on. I think yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So so we do find that depending on where you live, and it's based on humidity, that certain dust mites are more prevalent. So from our South African experience, we've got. The most prevalent mites are two mites called Der P and Der F, but we have what we call a tropical mite called Blomia tropicalis, which we found in the last 10 years in studies that's prevalent along the KZ and coastal area. We haven't done enough research to find it yet in Western Cape in the coastal regions, but in South Africa, we could say that because that particular dust mite likes humid climates, you're not necessarily going to get it in Kauteng. You would more likely get it in KZN and perhaps in the Western Cape. And then internationally, they found very, very similar things. Um, for example, so I know in Paris, I've worked with Montpellier University, is the same too. So Derpy and Der F, very, very prevalent in the larger French, uh, most in Paris, in the metropolitan city, all the areas around, um, around uh, Montpellier University. And then in Italy as well, we've done a lot of work there with the University of Pisa in Italy itself. So Rome, obviously we can imagine with the ancient ruins there that there's lots of old buildings and Der P and Der F, which are those two dust mites, very, very prevalent. Uh, in New York, they compared dust mites to from central Manhattan and areas like the Bronx. And they actually found that the Bronx area, because there were more uh, older flats with wooden staircases, that there was a, then now a completely different type of dust mite they found um, in that area specifically, which they didn't really find in Manhattan. Um, you see each dust mite likes a different type of, of what they call a perfect temperature and a perfect humidity level and a perfect climate. So based on that, you're going to get different organisms and different types of dust as well. And it will vary. It definitely will vary. Uh, I think Norway is probably um, going to have less dust mite because you're so established um, and, and um, because your healthcare obviously is, um, is more, I would say, first world than even some of the other European countries. Your population also is not that large. So remember, dust mite just breathes where people breathe, because when we breathe and we cough and we sneeze, we add to humidity and all of that stuff as well. Dust mites also love skin cells. So I should have mentioned that when we were talking about the beddies, all these patients who have eczema when they scratch, mm. skin cells are actually falling on the mattress. That's another thing for you to tell your doctors there in Norway, is that your skin cells don't fall on the on necessary literally always on the couch or on the car on the curtains or on the carpet but when you're scratching at night your skin cells fall on your mattress and dust mites feed off that they love skin cells and when they eat that they actually replicate more and more and more so that's why when you have more human bodies you're going to get more dust mite because you're going to get more feces and more human skin cells and human debris as well mm. right just out of interest, I mean, uh, those different uh, different sort of species of dust mites, do they have different um, impacts in terms of human health, or are they all pretty much the same? I think they are slightly different. Uh, we find that the derpy and derf, if the two more pre most prevalent ones, are uh, big big factors with uh, with skin, nose, and chest specifically. I should also mention because I'm not sure what other regions people are, are are logging in from, but there's a type of dust mite which we even specifically get in grains. Uh, we call it der microcerus. So I get lots of patients who see me from Swellendam and from George and Port Elizabeth who live in kind of like farming communities. So if they're dealing with flour and grains and they're in some industrial factory, there's a specific type of dust mite that loves those big sacks with rice and flour. There you've got a different type of dust mite. We, we don't taste it here because it's not so prevalent in these areas. But in, I'm not sure in Norway if you have many farms and industrial food places, but that type of dust mite might be prevalent in those areas. I, I don't know about Norway. I know in Denmark because there were studies in Copenhagen. So mm -hmm. there I know Der P and Der F is also very, very prevalent. 
Um, it's not abundant, so it's not a lot because it's also such a clean city. Mm. And, um, and uh, I think patients are well managed in terms of their allergies, but when they looked at all the allergens, it was very high up there in Copenhagen, dust mites. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Question, question from Justin Edwards uh, from the UK. He's not able to join us, um, but he posed... Wow, can I open this here now? He posed the question of, we know that clean my bed works and obviously we're removing dust mites from the bed is the first prize for obviously followed by the sanitizing that we do. But obviously in terms of advice, if and we, we're not doctors, so we're not, we're not giving medical advice, but in terms of best practices, what other um, not treatments or what other mechanisms can one follow in terms of, of dealing with dust mites? So... We have a whole list of guidelines uh, for patients, um, but over the years, there's been lots of research basically looking at each guideline separately to see not only which one reduces dust mite, but which one actually improves the patient's quality of life. The one that I always recommend is a mattress encasing. Um, there's a company, I'm not sure in the UK and in Europe, but once they vacuumed it, and this is something you guys can recommend, is a mattress encasing, because what the mattress encasing does, and that would make your job easier as well, is um, the, the threads or the fibers of the encasing are very tightly packed together, like right next to each other, so that dust mites can't penetrate through that, because we know that there's tons of dust mites in your mattress, irrespective of how clean or new your mattress is going to be if you buy your mattress today. But those dust mites are causing a problem when they come onto your skin. So what you want is you wanna to prevent too many dust mites from going through the fabric to the top and to the bottom. So that's one of the things I always recommend to patients. And it's, it's a very cheap thing to do is to get a special pillow cover and get a special mattress encasing. Um, the, the company that we recommend in South Africa is called DreamGuard because research has also been done through the fibers being packed tightly together. There's then the vacuum cleaners with the HEPA filter, which you guys are already doing, right? But not everybody can afford to invest in a HEPA filtration system and their house. And that's why, um, you know, you providing the service is a better thing. Um, and then depending on what you're dealing with, um, with kids that have lots of toys, we didn't talk about that, but I'm not sure, I'm sure you would tell me about your experiences with a lot of the homes you go to, especially in a child's bedroom, lots of teddy bears on that mm -hmm. mattress. Yeah. So those teddy bears carry tons of dust mite. So I often tell moms, and maybe you can advise these parents as well, is once you've cleaned the mattress, not to put those teddy bears back onto the mattress. Because what's gonna happen is those teddy bears are carrying millions of mites, they're gonna put it back on and then the mom's gonna feel that, you know, if there's no difference that yeah. it's your, your work is ineffective when yeah. actually it was, you know, what they're putting on top of the mattress that's carrying all the mites. So just all of those things, stuffed toys, carrying tons of mites on it, either removing it from the mattress or in kids who are attached to a particular toy or just, you know, it's a comfort issue, I tell moms to freeze their upholstered toys yeah. because dust mites uh, obviously don't like extreme temperatures. You know, that's why, they, that's why the, 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 the dust mites vary in terms of the country that they're in and the climate because they have a specific climate and a specific humidity that they flourish in. Um, if it's too hot or too cold, dust mites don't survive very well. So when you put them in the freezer, you're actually freezing. Just imagine imagine it's an ant or a spider. If you put it in the freezer, it's going to become hard and freeze to death. That's ex exactly what we're aiming to do with dust mites. And uh, washing a teddy bear is not going to remove the dust mites from inside. It would just clean it from the outside. So you could advise moms on teddy bears and any upholstered toys, putting it in a deep freeze in a packet, and then washing it and then putting it back on your mattress. And Charlie's got a question there. Yeah, um, Tulja, thank you. Uh, and I remember you telling us back in the early days about the life uh, of a dust mite in that their little feet are in fact suction pads. So um, when, we, when we 
go through the first part of the process in terms of removing the, the fecal matter and all the debris first, we're not necessarily removing all of the dust mites in that process. We are, however, doing it in the second part of the process, which then sort of um, uh, with the UVC, the sanitizing process. So am I right in saying that their, their little feet are like limpets, suction pads that yeah. get stuck into the actual fibers of the beds as well? Yeah. Yeah, so they have sticky, we call it sticky fat pads, Charlie. So under their feet, so they have eight feet, eight legs, dust mites, um, and they have sticky, we call it, it, it was a big laugh when we studied this and we found this out, you know, with the scientists, but it's literally, it's been named sticky fat pads and the fat pads help them to stick onto any fibers. That's why dust mites can stay, even though our curtains are vertical or our are vertical they can actually stay on and they can stick on and that's why and that's another nice thing for you to tell your patients and your gps as well um, conventional washing is not going to remove them because with conventional washing you're removing dust and dirt which is external dust but the actual dust mite is still sticking on and dust mites can swim as well wow. so when you're going to put them into water they actually going to either stay stuck on or they're going to survive in the water um, and those sticky fat pads what you want to do is you basically want to reduce the adhesiveness of those sticky fat pads so when you're vacuuming like charlie said with a HEPA filtration system continuously you're actually preventing that adhesiveness from staying stuck on there. And that's why when patients have very high dust allergy levels, those patients should be recommended to be doing this at, at least every three months because the dust mites are going to keep accumulating again and again. And if they're very highly allergenic, it's still going to cause the symptoms continuously. Does anyone have any questions? Otherwise, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll go through the last few of the questions that we've had posed. But I just want to find out from the floor if anyone has a question, just uh, let me know now and, and feel free to ask. Anyone? No questions? Let me read the last few. Yeah, so just jumping between my questions and uh, here we go. Um, so Question that came through from from uh, from Justin Edwards as well, um, also not able to join us as I said, is that dust mite allergies are associated with asthma, eczema, perennial allergic rhinitis. Are there any other associations that we should be aware of and talking to? Because obviously we're engaging with doctors, but there's also engagement with with organisations as a whole. Um, do you have any recommendations there? Uh, with other conditions, am I understanding correctly? Yeah, other, other conditions, con and, and I think he was referring to organizations that might obviously, like the Allergy Foundation of South Africa or anything along those lines, other conditions and then uh, organizations that might be um, dealing with those conditions. So I would say, firstly, the first part with other conditions, urticaria. So lots of patients who get welts and hives on their skin and on their bodies, some of those patients are getting it because they're allergic to something. So it could either be the dust mite that they're allergic to. So when they sleep at night, they get these red bumps all throughout their body. And um, then they're scratching all night. And that's uh, not necessarily eczema. You're gonna, they're gonna say red bumps or red welts. So that's if it's allergic. And the same thing would happen if they sit on grass. You know, They start getting welts and get itchy. Some patients have spontaneous urticaria, which means they're not really allergic to anything. Their body is just releasing histamine and their body is just now going to cause these welts irrespective. And there's multiple trigger factors. You know, stress is one of the trigger factors as well. But in those patients, even if they're not allergic to dust mite, if they're sleeping on a filthy mattress, or if they're sleeping and very often they have no allergies but they go stay in a hotel in an old hotel or in in an airbnb they often i can tell you from my experience with my patients they exacerbate they start itching and they start scratching because their body's just naturally releasing and producing histamine and, and the exposure to all of these allergens even if they're not allergic to it is going to obviously release and produce more histamine and it's going to irritate them more. So it can be an irritant for that. Um, so, uh, other organizations in South Africa, unfortunately, because there's so few allergists in South Africa, we only have the Allergy Foundation and the Allergy Society, which are basically, we're all the same people. So from the allergy perspective, um, 
I don't think maybe maybe looking at ENT surgeons. Have you guys been seeing the ENT surgeons or any ENT doctors? So I think I think till we uh, they're on our sort of hit list, and I think um, the the purpose of this or one of the purposes of this call is to really try and um, impart some confidence in everyone across the board to be able to go and speak with a degree of authority and on eye level when, when engaging with an allergologist or a, a pediatrician or, or whoever. Um, so this is being, you know, proving very helpful for, for arming everyone, I think. But. Yeah, so, so ENT surgeons would be dealing with hay fever a lot. Uh, dermatologists would be dealing with eczema. So those are two patients. And um, I, I'm gonna say this in the most, the lead, in the in in the nicest way, um, you know, uh, there's so many ENT conditions which I know nothing about, and there's so many dermatologic conditions that I know nothing about. But you guys probably would know more about dust mite allergy than some of the ENT surgeons that you're going to be talking to. I can tell you this with confidence from the patients that I see. Um, all around the country and even the dermatologists. So, you know, what I've shown you with the wraps that we do with eczema and how lots of them are triggered by, by dust mite. Um, most most uh, dermatologists just prescribe steroid creams to these patients. And I see these patients after they've been to maybe 10 dermatologists across the country and they're just not coming right because no matter what cream is prescribed to them, they're on multiple courses of steroids. This child is still constantly itching. This adult has still got really bad skin. Um, it's affected their quality of life. Some of them end up going to psychiatrists because they can't go out in public without uh, feeling conscious. Kids get teased at school. And I often, I just look at them and I, and but without doing the test, I tell them, I'm sure it's dust mite allergy. And we do the test and we realize, and it's something as simple as you know, either wrapping them or high doses of antihistamines, uh, depending on what they can afford. Um, and with some of them, we desensitize them. We cure the dust allergy or we cure the pollen allergy and it makes a huge difference. So, so even though you now are going to be able to speak with more, a bit more confidence, I think you should also, you guys should also know that when you are speaking to these doctors, they actually are not as clued up with how pollen and how dust mite does affect the nose and how it does affect the skin. Um, in South Africa, it's purely because allergy is a new field and it's not as established as it ought to be. Um, I think in Norway, it's probably far more established, but in the UK, it should be. But again, depending on which doctors they're seeing in the UK, because in the UK with the NHS, most patients are not seeing any allergologists. So patients are only going to see GPs there in the NHS system. And, and I also have lots of patients from the UK. I can tell you that they also not as clued up with, with all of the allergy information. Great. Okay. Perfect. Um, are there no, any, any other questions from the, the floor? Anyone? Um, I would just really like to ask you, Tuda, uh, how uh, did you get into this? Was it Charlie that came to you and came and cleaned your bed? Or <laughs> how did you get into it? Um, how did you get, um, um, how did we get under your skin? <laughs> well, actually, yeah, I think uh, Charlie and Tracy just found me at the, um, Charlie, you could tell them how you how you found me, but I can tell you that when Charlie first met me, gosh, Charlie, that was the day I I I, I broke my tire. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, That's Gary, I, I, and Gary's here as well. I drove over a stone, and I had a really fat flat bust tire and I was seeing patients and seeing Charlie try to fix my tire at the same time had no car to drive back with and Charlie came to meet me I'm not sure how Charlie found me but when he spoke to me about this there's some of these pictures I've showed you with these patients with wraps um, this was way before I even knew clean my bed existed and way before I even met Charlie so you know and and when I started my allergy in 2015 
from then uh, my interest, because when we do the subspecialty, we have an option of whether or not we want to do a research project. And my interest and my research project that we published last year, it started in 2015. Um, that was always my interest. And that was what we wanted to do is vacuum up mattresses and look at what the components are in mattresses and compare urban and rural for the South African, uh, the kind of the South African experience. Um, and, and as I did clinical work, I not only was vacuuming these mattresses and, and analyzing it, I was seeing the impact on patients as well. So when Charlie came to speak to me and told me that he had this, he probably didn't even realize that he, I don't think Charlie even knew I was working on this project because we hadn't published it yet. Um, but while I, I told him, I didn't think we were removing all the dust mites, which you know he's shared with you, it's because in our research project, we were looking at everything else in the dust, you know, the peanut in the dust, like I said, cat, dog, cockroach, mouse. And those things kind of spoke to me with how this would work. The other reason why I, I, I saw this company as being so beneficial is because, like I said, with the measures, one of the measures we, we do recommend is a HEPA filtration vacuum, generally. Yeah. But everyone knows how expensive those are and patients can't afford to spend 12,000 rand on a vacuum cleaner not everyone can afford that uh, to go out and buy um, a super vacuum cleaner that's going to have this entire system so this is obviously a way to make sure that your direct exposure of you know what your skin or your mouth or your nose is getting exposed to is getting cleaned without making that massive investment fantastic uh, Tulsi, I think we're going to try and wrap things up because I know we've, we've taken a lot of your time as it is and you are very busy. Um, but I think the bottom line is it, just hearing this once again from you and, and the validation from a, from a professional such as yourself um, is going to help a great deal, in particular when we are dealing with medical professionals. And as you say, some of them may know less than we do in terms of, of dust mites and the impact that that actually has on health. So it's, it's great to have, have had you on. I know, I know Tracy wanted to just uh, end off with something there. Um, but on behalf of the ambassadors, I just wanted to say thank you for making the time and uh, really endorsing what we're doing and, and, and equipping us that we can, we can really make a difference in the, uh, the, the health, the well-being, the lives of those clients that we are going out and servicing. And as long as we keep doing that, uh, everything else will fall into place. And obviously equipping us with that when, we, when interacting with doctors in particular is, is going to help tremendously. So thank you. Thanks, Barry. Um, yeah, Tulja, I just wanted to say um, a massive thank you for taking um, time out this afternoon. We know how busy you are taking time away from your patients and your busy schedule to be with us. And I know I speak not only on behalf of Charlie and myself, but on behalf of all the ambassadors when I say that we are so fortunate to have your support and belief in what we are doing. Um, and your wealth of knowledge and expertise is absolutely invaluable to us. Um, so thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate your time and we really appreciate you. Thanks. Thank, thank you, everyone. And like I said, uh, when I started with, um, I think that the fact that you guys are not just keen in selling the product, the fact that you're so keen in understanding the science, to me as a medical professional, it, it says a lot about your ethic, your work ethic and as a company, um, because you don't really need to know all this information to sell something and make a profit. The fact that you're taking out the extra time to want to know what's going on, um, I, I, for me, I, I'm happy to contribute to that. Very kind of you, Tilja. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Gary and I are off to London on, on the weekend. We're going to meet Allergy UK and Asthma UK as well. So uh, to try and sort of spread the word to them and to get them on board as well. So some of the people here on, online here are from the UK operation as well. Um, so anyway, um, I want to thank you as well and uh, Gary here beside me as well. Um, so thanks a lot thank from, you. from us all. And uh, I will be quiet now, but bless you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, bye. Thank well, you thank very everyone. much. Have, Have a lovely evening. evening. Thank you, Tolja. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.